So welcome everyone to this afternoon's lecture series, uh, the joint series between the University of Cambridge Department of Psychiatry and uh, Cambridge and Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Professor Hakwin Lau uh, to, for our talk this afternoon. Uh, Professor Lau uh, started off his career as an undergraduate in cognitive science and philosophy at, at Hong Kong University and then did his PhD at Oxford on the brain mechanisms of spontaneous actions and then has had uh, been all around the world in his research career to date, including uh, the Wellcome Trust Centre for Neuroimaging in London, um, a stint at Columbia University in New York, uh, professorship at UCLA in, in Los Angeles, uh, and he's now director for the Laboratory for Consciousness at uh, the Riken Centre for Brain Sciences in Japan. Um, and he's going to speak to us this afternoon, as you can see, on a subject very close to our brains uh, towards the translational neuroscience of consciousness. Professor Lau, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great pleasure to be here. Um... So I will talk about uh, some of the work that I, I do that has a, a small clinical flavor, but really I started out my career doing something that is uh, much more maybe indulgent or, or esoteric, if you will. Um, so I, I, was in, I was an undergraduate uh, in, in philosophy and I was really interested in questions like what, what, what sets our, our, our human brains apart from um, computers. So uh, robots and computers, um, can be very sophisticated these days, but um, they are not meant to feel any uh, subjective experiences. And so I thought, like, what, what was the, 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 the difference between our brains and their brains? And now some of you might think, well, this is a bit of a funny way to, um, to um, try to understand consciousness, because on the other hand, what about humans and, and other animals? And some of you might think that animals clearly are, are conscious uh, or not. And so that may not be may not be such a uniquely human feature. So here's a video um, I, I like to show sometimes. And if you look at a video like that, you, you would quite clearly um, think that the dog seems to be seem to be really scared. And so you think that like if you have people uh, those of you who have pets, you will think that like animals clearly are, are conscious in the sense of having subjective experiences. But um, as soon as we consider animals like that, you can also uh, look at plants like this. So this is a, a plant called a mimosa pudica, also called a shy plant. If you look at it, and it does seem like it is reacting to external stimulus um, in a way that that almost feels as if it has some sort of an uh, some sort of an emotional life. Um, but I think very few of us actually think that the, the, sh the shy plant is actually shy. It's just a, it's just a, a reaction, just, just, a, just a kind of reflex. And I think it kind of brought out the issue that just looking at a, a creature is very hard to, to really determine whether um, it has subjective experience or not. <clears throat> so in the field, what we do um, is just a quick snapshot of um, how, how the science has been. Basically, I think this is something that most of us do, uh, even though we sometimes don't flesh out the, the, um, the, the logic behind. The idea is that we look for the neural correlates of consciousness in, in people. So we compare cases when they are conscious versus when they are uh, not conscious. Uh, usually is conscious with respect to a particular stimulus. So we are not interested in whether they're generally aroused or awake but we are interested in uh, whether they have a subjective experience for a particular um, uh, perceptual process. And then we try to look for this uh, so-called NCC, the neural correlates of consciousness. And then we can see what the mechanism is or are in, in, in the brain uh, for conscious experiences. Then we can actually go and look at other creatures uh, and then see whether they're conscious. So the way I do these studies uh, is a bit different from how it's typically done. So this is actually a, a, a brain image of a, of a patient who has blind sight. So um, the blind sight patient has a lesion to the uh, primary visual area, such that in the blind field, uh, in the half of the uh, hemi field, um, half of the visual field, um, the, the patient basically cannot subjectively see things. And yet, if you present a stimulus uh, to the blind field and make the subject press keys to guess the identity of the stimulus, um, the, the person actually uh, could perform at about 75% correct, which is quite a lot above chance. And then here, what we did was we presented a, a, a weaker stimulus, a stimulus of a lower luminance contrast to the normal field, to the, to the intact sighted field. 
so that we titrated the performance level down to the same level. So basically, the, now the, the person can perform equally well uh, in discriminating a simple visual shape for, for both sides. And you can see that basically, the, um, the, so task performance is matched, but the ability to, to actually generate subjective experience after each trial, when they say that did they see it or did they just guess what it is, it is, is a lot more frequent in the, in the normal field. It's not 100% because it's a titrated uh, weak stimulus. So if we compare these two cases, you'll see that um, uh, quite, quite quite surprisingly to myself back then, that actually a lot of brain activity still differs between the uh, normal and, and sighted field and, and blind and blind field. So in the sense that the the conscious uh, stimulation to the to the normal field activated a lot of activity in the frontal and parietal areas, maybe in particular the frontal areas. So it was surprising to me because I thought. Uh, a lot of people find these findings and they find that, you know, the prefrontal cortex might be important for conscious perception. But I thought that most of, most of it was driven by the fact that when you're conscious, you're more able to do the task. And the prefrontal cortex obviously is very important for task related processing. Uh, but here the task performance is matched. And yet we found that, uh, that there is this difference that just reflects the subjective experience. And you can replicate these kind of studies conceptually in, uh, in, just um, undergrads and in, in people from the general population. And again, you can try to match task performance and find some difference in subjective ratings of awareness. And you will find that there is some quite observable difference in, in prefrontal cortices, in prefrontal cortex. So, um, so that's interesting. Uh, a lot of people think that these findings are wrong because they would say, well, if you lesion the prefrontal cortex, um, people don't, don't go blind. Um, and I think that's true. Uh, um, first of all, you shouldn't lesion people's prefrontal cortex, but, but if you look at patients with prefrontal lesions, uh, often they have other problems and they don't really complain about um, uh, blindness or, or lack of perception. But if we really try to understand the, the background here, we are not saying that prefrontal mechanisms uh, will allow them to see in the sense of being able to do visual task we are particularly concerned with their um, introspection or the, the subjective experience per se. So when we actually apply um, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation to the prefrontal cortex, actually uh, they, people in fact did not, did not, did not in fact uh, uh, imp impair their ability to do task. But what it changed is uh, a measure that I, that I kind of unpack here. Uh, sometimes I call it metacognitive uh, efficiency, meta D prime, et cetera. So it, it's really come from some nitty gritty signal detection theory that we don't need to go into today. But what it really tracks is the correlation between uh, across trials, uh, between your trial accuracy and your subjective rating. That is uh, for a normal subject, usually when they say that they see the things very clearly, they're more likely to be correct and incorrect. But if you apply TMS uh, to the prefrontal cortex, then this correlation kind of breaks down. And Steve Fleming uh, in London, actually, uh, when he was in New York, he actually looked into patients too with unilateral lesions in the prefrontal cortex. And it turns out that uh, this measure also uh, get impaired in these patients. So, so it's, again, it's not that they cannot perform visual tasks. They can, uh, in fact, that's why probably why they don't complain about the, the perceptual capacities. But if you put them at a near threshold situation, uh, that is when they are sometimes correct and sometimes not correct, and you ask them to rate the visibility or confidence, then it, that becomes much less um, diagnostic of whether they're correct on a particular trial. So the, the introspection somehow um, um, breaks down a little bit. And what I like about this study uh, by Steve Fleming is that it's all, they also, he also showed that it is actually uh, modality specific. So it's not just general introspection that is impaired. So in a memory task, for instance, you can actually do the same measure. You can after each trial measure how correct they are and also make people rate how, how sure they are that they're correct. Or you can do the kind of remember no judgment. And, and if you actually uh, look at these patients, uh, their correlation uh, in, in that in the memory domain is completely intact. It, so the breakdown only happens in, in the perceptual domain. So it's about perceptual introspection that seems to be problematic. So you may think, so, so what is the prefrontal cortex doing then uh, in these tasks and how is it related to consciousness? 
Well, I would think the, the, the mechanism is probably something like this, is that when you have a, um, um, a, a percept, let's say you, you, you're seeing a duck, you probably have uh, duck neurons, uh, strangely uh, somewhat true, that you have actually specific uh, uh, neuronal um, representations that, that actually represent the duck. But just having that is obviously uh, not quite sufficient for your, for your percept to be conscious because these neurons also fire uh, uh, sometimes just spontaneously. So we, we know that all neurons in the brain has a fair amount of baseline fluctuation and firing. So sometimes your duct neurons will be spontaneously activated uh, and you don't hallucinate duct in those cases because presumably somewhere downstream, your brain has mechanism to, to filter those, those uh, noise, uh, spontaneous noise away, filter it out. And also uh, if you actively uh, imagine a duck, uh, you also don't uh, hallucinate ducks, right? So you have sometimes a, some degree of uh, imagery, but that is never um, confused with, with the normal perception of a duck unless you are in some sort of state of psychosis or hallucination or dreaming. And in those states, uh, we tend to think that uh, some sort of uh, failure of prefrontal mechanism is involved. So what I'm saying essentially is you have these uh, first order duck representations or perceptual representations of any kind, uh, and that, that may be the, the normal input or even a necessary component of your conscious percept. But really this lay stage monitoring in the prefrontal cortex is also a, a key part to decide whether you're just imagining something or you're really seeing something or uh, whether it's just noise. So I elaborate on this further in my book that is coming out uh, next year in February. Uh, for a shorter version, there's also a, a, short pa a shorter paper discussing this kind of uh, mechanisms. So I can go on and on about this kind of uh, stuff, but I'm, I'm not going to, uh, as you may be aware, um, what I actually just said right now, uh, very briefly, is actually controversial. Um, the, the fact that the neural correlate of consciousness is in the prefrontal cortex is a, a hotly debated and contested notion. Uh, the, the lesion effects that I talk about uh, addresses some of it, and, but some people continue to, to be doubtful. And then about the theoretical mechanism, that's where things get really crazy and uh, sometimes very, very, uh, very esoteric. And, and so I'm not going to go into that so much more today, but rather um, I want to talk about out of my frustration in, in debating with my colleagues, sometimes I, I actually went the other way and I thought, well, I mean, all these theories are very well, uh, and it, 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 it satisfies my, my undergraduate philosophical interests, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to continue to, to debate about them. But for the science to go forward, uh, it would probably be useful if we just go ahead and, and, and see what applications we can generate based on these so-called theories and see how far we can go. I mean, if, uh, if, if our views are really correct, there should be something we can, we can do about do about um, um, various diseases and, 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 and disorders. So one very kind of obvious um, or maybe even trivial um, application you can, you can derive based on the, the view I just had, I, I just show you, was that if you think of the way that how people think of conscious and non-conscious processing traditional in the brain, quite often they would think of it as, you know, different parallel streams or, or, or different brain regions. Uh, uh, being responsible for, 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 for both of them, respectively. So non-conscious processing might be, you know, in the dorsal stream or something or, or in the subcortical areas. So some dedicated pathway for non-conscious processing and conscious processing might be in, in different specific areas. So what I said earlier is actually a, a rejection of this view. Uh, and rather, I would say that, well, conscious and non-conscious representations actually overlap so that in the early century areas, you have these uh, object selective uh, activity and, and they are common between conscious and non-conscious processing. What really distinguished them is some later stage monitoring activity. And if that's true, um, then that means that uh, you can basically uh, take a non-conscious representation and try to manipulate it and it would basically impact on your conscious processing too, because it's shared. Whereas if they are distinct, then you, if you manipulate the non-conscious stuff, you may always never change your conscious uh, experience. Uh, 
So, um, so just to make a concrete example, so one thing maybe we can do would be to do this kind of non-conscious exposure therapy. So I think many of you would know this much better than I do. I, I only dabble in this area. But my understanding is if, if someone has, a, let's say, a phobia, then I think a standard uh, treatment in clinical psychology would be to uh, uh, give them exposure therapy. So if you're afraid of spiders, then maybe you can, um, in, a, in, a, in a clinical setting, try to uh, imagine spiders and talk about spiders and eventually look at spiders and maybe even gradually learn to uh, touch and interact with spiders. So through this exposure, people would uh, overcome the, the excessive uh, fear for, for, for the object. But the problem, of course, is, is, is very unpleasant to do that. And some people would drop out from the treatment uh, prematurely. But if I, what I just said was correct, that the spider representations in the brain are the same or common uh, between, between conscious and, and non-conscious perceptions of spiders, then you should be able to non-consciously expose yourself to, to spiders. And then over time, you, you would unconsciously get used to uh, spiders and, and that would, should be able to reduce your conscious experience for, for, for spiders too. And in fact, uh, we did something like that. Um, and, and the way we did it was a little bit, um, was a little bit um, involved. And, and so you might think that well, one way to, to non-consciously present spider would just be to present a spider image and then use backward masking or something like that to, to mask it out. Um, we didn't do that because um, I, I thought that if you use backward masking, uh, you, you, in fact, you, you could do some degree of um, uh, exposure therapy that way. And people have done that too. But I think the signal would be pretty small. That is, if you show a, 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 a spider image very briefly and then you visually mask it, basically you don't really see it. There's a little bit of uh, uh, residual act activity in your in your brain uh, that might be able to do something, but but it won't be so powerful. So instead, we we did something that uh, my colleagues in Japan have uh, invented. That I really love this method because it's so um, it's really a very powerful way of, of um, manipulating non-conscious representations in your brain. So the idea is we put people in a scanner and um, just tell them to focus on, the, on their mind. And then while they're doing that, in fact, we uh, read out the brain activity in the, in, 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 in the different parts of the visual cortices and, and prefrontal cortex, et cetera, using uh, fMRI combined with uh, online multivariate decoding techniques. So essentially the, 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 the data is fed to a computer and the computer basically try to read out the content of the brain, uh, fine brain voxel patterns. And then after about 10 seconds or so, we give them a feedback based on this uh, decoding process. So if the, if the brain pattern looks like what we want it to be, then we give them a, a big feedback. There might be a huge circle, indicate that they have won something up, up to like half a pound or some, uh, like some, some, some amount of money that they would get in the end of the experiment. And we repeat this procedure for hundreds of trials. So that takes you know, a few hours, to spread it off over a few sessions. And what happens is um, uh, actually in the, in the decoding, the decoder can be set that such that, um, let's say um, you, would, you would get a big feedback only if you see uh, some red lines, but not green lines, or only if your brain patterns looks as if it is representing uh, red lines rather than green lines. And then, uh, so, so every time your brain thinks about red lines, you'll get a big feedback. But after a few uh, uh, hours of training, people learn to do that and they get a lot of money and they're very happy. And if you ask them what were they doing, they would say that they have no idea. Um, and some people would sometimes would say that they have some idea. Uh, and you ask them, they would say, oh, I'm thinking about uh, uh, Beethoven music. I'm thinking about uh, my parents or something. They, they would think about something that has nothing to do with red lines and green lines. Um, and if you actually then reveal to them that actually in this experiment, you, you win this uh, uh, monetary feedback only when you uh, think about either green lines or, or, or red lines, you're in either one of the groups and you ask them to guess which group they're in, there will be a chance. So the idea is that basically you, uh, you, you get to uh, basically uh, reward people or reinforce people to activate a certain neural pattern and they will be none the wiser. And if you think about why that would work, um, I, I, I think 
in hindsight, it is somewhat obvious because most of what we are doing is not really neurofeedback. I mean, sometimes we call it decoded neurofeedback, DACNF, uh, but really it's a kind of passive reinforcement of uh, spontaneous brain activities. So we essentially, when we tell them to focus on their mind, I'm not sure it's doing anything there. Uh, rather, the brain has spontaneous activity anyway. And as I alluded to earlier, your, much of your spontaneous brain activity is non-conscious. That's why we don't hallucinate cats and, and, and ducks or whatever objects every, every few seconds, even though those spring activity does come and go in, 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 in these slow cycles. Um, so essentially, we are just rewarding a certain uh, neural pattern uh, that is usually uh, non-conscious. So, so what good is that? Well, then basically uh, that gives us the, um, the means to do what, what, I, what I alluded to earlier, that is non-conscious exposure therapy. So we, in fact, uh, in this experiment that we did, we, we show people red lines and green lines, and then we decoded um, the, the voxel patterns responsible for these percepts uh, in the brain. And then we actually did these uh, very uh, standard uh, fear conditioning studies or, or threat conditioning as some people call it. So we actually pair, let's say red lines with, uh, with electric shock and also green line also with electric shock. So both of these become CS plus um, and, and I call this a target and this one a control and it will become clearer in a minute why, why I do so. And then I have another CS minus which is not paired with, with shock. So these are all standard, uh, you know, associative learning uh, studies. And, and this is so far just a, a, a reality check. So this is basically showing the skin conductance response for the target and the control uh, relative to the CS minus. So this is essentially saying that after this uh, uh, threat conditioning procedure, if we just show people the, the image without the shock, then uh, the target and the control both would induce a positive skin conductance response showing that they're physiologically aroused when they uh, when they see when they see the, the red lines or green lines relative to the yellow lines so both of them are positive and similar and then now then 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 the exciting part starts which is now okay so they're not afraid of the red line and green lines we can put them in the scanner and do what i described earlier this neurofeedback procedure that is every time the brain pattern of activity looks like it's representing red line, I give them a, a, a feedback signal indicating that they, they earn a, a fraction of a pound, uh, some money. And, and so after a few hours of this training, then lo and behold, you see that the, um, we, we show them these uh, images again, and then this time the target, that is the, the, the red lines, which is the target for this procedure, actually show the reduced uh, uh, skin conductance response. That is as if their brain became less afraid of these uh, red lines now. So first we, we, we acquire, we, we pair these with, with shock so that we, we, we make sure that the, these images acquire the level of fear. Um, but now that after this procedure, this counter conditioning procedure, if you will, then essentially yeah, the, the level of uh, physiological arousal is reduced. And I call it counter conditioning just following the uh, animal learning literature because essentially this CS plus has been acquired, uh, has been associated with a, a negative um, um, valence because of the shock. But now here, essentially, every time the brain unconsciously think of the red line, they get rewarded. So it's kind of like conditioning out the, the previously acquired threat. So, so this is presumably how it works. So this is why this shows a reduction of this uh, skin conductance response. Okay, so far so good. Um, so now, the, I, I know that when we published it, a lot of people thought that this is a little crazy and, and probably too good to be true. Uh, and I thought so too. Uh, I, I thought, yeah, it may be a fluke or um, the, the effect also wasn't so, so, so striking. But nevertheless, uh, my, my other postdoc, um, uh, Vincent uh, Tastro de Monchel, uh, who's now um, gotten, just gotten independent in, in Montreal, and he kind of saw the potential of this and decided to take that one step further and said, okay, why don't we try to replicate it, the study, because a lot of people didn't believe it. And we also, besides convincing ourselves, we also want to actually take it one step further, closer to, to the clinic. And the idea is, well, we can stop doing these red lines and green lines because who cares about them? Uh, what really is um, uh, more relevant uh, would be um, these natural objects, 
for which people actually sometimes do develop phobia. So here we uh, presented many images of different animals and, and, and man-made objects to people in the scanner. You can see these images uh, involve sometimes snakes, uh, rabbits, which is not so not so frightening, but sometimes there are snakes and there are spiders, etc. And when we presented these to people uh, in the scanner, then we recorded the brain activity. So with today's uh, um, imaging technique, we can actually decode based on the, the voxel patterns in areas like ventral temporal areas in the visual stream, then we can actually uh, decode and basically predict what people are seeing based on the, the brain activity alone. So the idea is then, well, if we can decode those, then maybe we can repeat this uh, uh, non-conscious exposure therapy, now this time for, for real life objects. But now you might think there's a problem here. Um, and, and in fact, this is quite a nice and, and interesting conceptual problem. If we want to repeat what uh, Aiko Izumi did in the last study, that is after we decoded um, the voxel patterns for spiders and snakes, et cetera, then yes, then we can do this counter conditioning. Then let's say every time the brain thinks of a spider, we then give them a bit of money, then we can non-consciously counter condition out the, the fear or the threat for, for spider. But that isn't going to be much use for, 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 for the clinic because, um, well, to, to decode that pattern for, for spider in the first place, as I just showed you, you have to show people many images of spiders and snakes. And if for, for, for a patient that is actually suffering from phobia, then they wouldn't enjoy that procedure very much. So we're kind of back to square one. So because I, I try to motivate the procedure as non-conscious, but the, the part that you need to get the voxel patterns, uh, you typically want to would actually present image to the patient because different people's voxel patterns for spiders and snakes are different. It depends on the fine grain vasculature in, in the brain. But Vincent has really this uh, really clever uh, uh, solution that, that wasn't exactly invented by us. It was invented by uh, Jim Hexby uh, almost a decade ago. Um, 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 as, as a basic fMRI method. But I think we might be the first one to make use of it in, in this uh, clinical setting. So the idea is you don't actually need to show um, the patient images of um, spiders and snakes to, to estimate the voxel patterns for spiders and snakes for that patient. In fact, you can do it via other people's data. So the, the way it works is um, it's mathematically quite elegant, but conceptually also quite, quite um, intuitive. If you, for instance, um, think of me as a surrogate, let's say I'm not afraid of spiders and snakes, uh, I can actually be your surrogate. Then you and I can both uh, watch some other stuff, let's say apples and orange and cats and dogs. So we watch these, others, uh, these other, other objects uh, together. And after we watch those, we can try to rearrange our brain voxels spatially so that we are in the same space by which I mean uh, my, my representation for apples and oranges and, and cats and dogs will be exactly the same as yours for apples and oranges and cats and dogs. We try to maximize the, the similarity for these uh, objects between my brain and your brain. And having done that, then now that we know that we're in the same space, well, then I can, I can go and watch spiders and snakes, which I'm not afraid of, but you are. Uh, let's say, then, then after I get my uh, voxel patterns for spiders and snakes estimated through this common space, I can then try to infer, okay, because my brain voxels are in a space that is so similar to yours for normal objects, then I can basically infer my, my voxel pattern for snakes and spiders uh, can be applied to yours too. So then you never have to see spiders and snakes and I can still estimate yours, uh, what, what the patterns would be. And so now that, that that sounds good conceptually, but you might think, well, even if it works, it sounds a little bit like a, uh, like a kind of moonshot <laughs> uh, sci-fi um, uh, procedure. It, even if it works, it cannot be so perfect. And in fact, you're right. It is not, it's not perfect at all. But the good thing is once you have one surrogate, uh, nothing stops you from having another one. So not just I can be a surrogate. In fact, someone else can be a surrogate. And in fact, we can get 100 surrogates lined up and with that, then all of these people, you know, put their brain activity will be in the same space as yours. And they, they, they go and watch uh, spiders and, and snakes for a long time. So then you can average a lot of data and to use that to, to, to harness the amount of data to estimate your spider and snake pattern. And if you do that, then turns out that we can actually then estimate your, your voxel patterns for spiders and snakes without you having to ever seen a single spider 
uh, or snake. And, and you can do it pretty well up to like 80% correct in decoding or sometimes 90% accuracy in decoding. So with that, then Vincent solved the problem. So we actually can have patients in the scanner and they just watch a bunch of stuff, not stuff that they're afraid of, just, just common stuff. And then we, uh, meanwhile, ask them what they're afraid of. Let's say they are actually afraid of spiders and snakes. Then uh, we estimate these patterns from other people's data. And then we randomize it. We, in fact, we do, um, uh, interestingly, we, we let the computer randomize it. And this, this point I think will be important in a bit. Um, and so we pick one as a target, the other as a control. Uh, let's say in this one, spider is a target and, and snake is a control. Uh, then in the, in the scanner, we go through this counter conditioning procedure again. So every time your brain thinks of the target, that is the spider, uh, I give you the feedback signal, then you earn a little bit of money. And then the question then is, can we actually do this? Can we actually reduce the fear for this uh, uh, naturally threatening uh, animal? And the answer is yes. And, and in fact, this time it works even better than the last time, maybe by luck or maybe uh, because we actually enhanced the procedure a little bit. So this is, uh, again, like the, like the study I showed earlier, this is actually in skin conductance. So uh, again, for the target only, the, the skin conductance before and after the procedure, when you actually show the image, the, the SCR response actually reduced. So you're physiologically less, less uh, aroused by, by, this, by this image. In fact, almost flattened the response. And for the control, it remained similar. Um, and then you can also look at the brain itself. So some people take amygdala as somewhat indirectly related to you know, um, these kind of threat response. It's not a perfect index at all, but, it, but it, it, it is a physiological index you can measure in the brain. And again, you can see that for the target, but not for the control, it's specifically for the target. It again, it flattened this response. So it looks like it worked, it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, it, we, we managed to use this uh, neural feedback or, or, or neural reinforcement procedure to non-consciously, without the subject knowing, uh, and without us knowing too, we, don't, we didn't know which was the target, which was the control, we reduced the physiological arousal. Okay, so that's very exciting, uh, but I'm now gonna give you a little bit of twist and, and disappointment. Um, and in fact, when we uh, did those studies, we also asked people to rate the subjective ratings of fear for these different animals. And it turns out uh, the procedure, although it completely flattened the physiological response, it didn't change the subjective ratings of fear at all. Uh, in fact, they, they, they basically just gave the same level uh, of ratings for, for both the target and the control. So that's a bit of a disappointment. Um, but my, my friend and colleague, um, uh, co-author Joe Ladue actually would say this is great because he's been arguing that the amygdala is actually not the fear center, despite um, this idea sometimes being associated with his earlier work. He would say that the amygdala basically is just the, uh, just controls the physiological arousal that is not fear itself because fear is a conscious experience. And so now that we have targeted all this non-conscious stuff that we managed to get rid of the physiological arousal, uh, but it is not meant to change your subjective fear at all. So that's, um, that, so he liked this finding, I, I don't. I, I, I thought it was really, really very disappointing that we failed to change the conscious fear. But I think the, um, the idea goes back to our, our, our earlier um, notion that this is maybe how consciousness works, is that it's basically a higher order view, right? So you have a, if in the case of perception of a duck, you have a first order representation that is non-conscious. And what makes this conscious is some lay stage monitoring mechanism in the prefrontal cortex. And perhaps in the case of fear, it actually works exactly the same way. You have this amygdala, um, response and many people think that it, it reflects fear but maybe it's really just a non-conscious first order representation that that is uh, potentially frightening but is mostly just physiological arousal and then if that get monitored by some late stage process as conscious then that's when your conscious experience arise so i thought okay this is this is maybe not not all is lost maybe we can actually now think of how to target this part as well and 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 then we can actually change the conscious fear so we haven't gotten this far. I shouldn't uh, overpromise. We are, we are thinking about that. But just before that, we want to just show you some evidence that uh, this notion of um, that prefrontal cortex might actually control your, your conscious experience of fear uh, might have some, 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 uh, some credibility. So 
going back to this uh, same data set, actually, uh, we, we, I showed you earlier. So Vincent showed a lot of images to people uh, in the scanner so we can decode these uh, different animals and objects. And if you just plot the data this way, uh, you'll see there's something quite interesting. So I'm plotting here is uh, on the uh, uh, vertical axis is the uh, actual uh, physiological arousal when you show people these different categories. Um, and on the horizontal axis, I'm showing that the subjective fear rating people give when they see these images. As you see, they, they, they do correlate. The correlation is actually fairly strong. So, so that's good. So, so that means that your, your, your SCR, your skin conductance, is some sort of measure of your subjective fear. But you also see that there's a fair bit of, um, I mean, it's not the correlation also isn't perfect, right? So, and, and this is actually a cross subject. So it's systematically, you see that there are uh, some objects um, for which the, um, the physiological arousal is higher than the actual fear rating. So a spider is one of them. Uh, cockroaches is one of them. And then there, there are some other uh, images for which the subjective fear rating is actually uh, uh, higher than the, the physiology. So something people say that they're afraid, uh, in fact, they are, they, the subjective rating is, is higher than the physiological arousal indicates. So there's a bit of dissociation too. So we can capitalize on that and also the time course of the, of the, of the subjective fear rating and, and the physiological arousal is also different. So you can capitalize on these subtle dissociations and try to find, uh, look across the brain and find brain patterns of activity that can predict um, one better than the other. I mean, predict, let's say, subjective ratings better than it predicts skin conductance or some other areas would predict skin conductance better than it predicts subjective ratings. So uh, if you look at the uh, decoders that are better for decoding uh, skin conductance, you will see that the classic so-called fear network of activity actually shows up. These are amygdala, insula, uh, ventral medial PFC. So when, when people, especially, especially in the animal models, when people study fear, usually these are the, 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 the key areas of the brain. Uh, but it turns out uh, they actually predict skin conductance really well, but maybe not as well uh, for um, subjective ratings, which makes sense because in animal models of, of, of fear, obviously you can't ask a, a rodent to, to report subjective ratings. So all of those fear uh, indices are, were basically behavioral, uh, either some sort of uh, freezing behavior or something like that. And I think those are really driven by these uh, so-called limbic areas. And on the other hand, if you really want to track uh, which are the brain areas that would decode the subjective ratings really well, they tend to be in the prefrontal cortex. They are actually exactly in those areas I talk about in the early part of the talk. Uh, actually, they're common for perceptual awareness as well, uh, even in the visual domain. So they're like middle frontal gyrus, uh, lateral prefrontal areas. Uh, these are areas that actually would uh, track the subjective ratings really well. <laughs> So essentially, uh, what, I, what I'm saying is we, we have hereby uh, 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 some evidence um, that, this, that supports this view that maybe uh, a lot of these uh, first order uh, areas for fear is really just driving the physiology or mainly driving the physiology. For fear to really happen, your prefrontal cortex would also need to be engaged. <laughs> this is a bit of an extreme view. Um, some people don't like it, and I'm aware of that. And some people would say, uh, for instance, they would say the prefrontal cortex is only engaged in these uh, tasks because you have to report the content of your, um, of, of, of your awareness. So the prefrontal cortex is just for reporting or for attending to the, to, to the content. It's not for subjective experience itself. But I would argue, um, yeah, that might be a concern, but, but at least not for this study, right? Because in this study, uh, when people were looking at these images, in fact, we didn't ask them to uh, report what is the content uh, of the fear, uh, or, or we didn't ask them to, 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 to make this, the fear rating in the scanner. It's all done outside the scanner after they watch these images. And in the scanner, all they have to do was to press a button when the category change. So let's say snake changed to rabbit, then they have to press a button here. And if it changed to a cat, then they press a button there. So they were not asked to attend to the level of fear. They were not asked to think about the fear. And yet the, um, the level of, of fear rating, as you can infer from, from the subsequent behavioral rating, can be decoded here from the prefrontal cortex. So I would say that this is definitely not always true that the prefrontal cortex only cares about the report. Uh, and as some other people say that it's content-free and that's, it's also definitely not true. I think what they're referring to is that the, at the level of fMRI, 
the prefrontal activity often doesn't have the resolution to really distinguish between the different uh, content. I think that that's that's true, but that's the limitation of fMRI, not not a, not the limitation of the prefrontal cortex. If you actually go into the physio physiology uh, using uh, looking at single cell studies, which we reviewed here in this paper, you will see that the prefrontal cortex certainly is not content free. So now you may think, okay, so now we have prefrontal uh, uh, patterns that we can then target, then we can do this again using this uh, counter conditioning procedure, then maybe we can treat uh, the level of fear. And, and unfortunately, uh, we can't. <laughs> the reason is, um, so far, uh, as I kind of hinted in the last slide, that you can decode the subjective ratings of fear from the prefrontal cortex, but we are not quite there yet in decoding the, the animal identities. So if you um, think about the logic of the study, the, uh, what we want to do is to find these patterns of activity in the prefrontal cortex that actually would represent the conscious perception of the different uh, animals and objects. And then we try to counter condition them. Um, but we are not quite there yet. Decoding the, the actual content from prefrontal patterns is actually still pretty hard. Uh, we are working on that right now because I do think, as I said, the, the physiology suggests that you should be able to do that. It's just that at the resolution of fMRI, the, the neurons in the prefrontal cortex are all mixed. So it's pretty hard to, to do that, to do that uh, well. But we are now having more data and improving the resolution. So maybe eventually we'll get there. So for now, we just focus on the ventral temporal area um, about wrapping up, but just to um, give you a sense of where we're going, we're actually basically replicating Vincent's study and uh, this time uh, in actual phobic patients. So the last study I show you was actually not in patients. They are in uh, basically people from the general population capitalizing on the fact that everybody is afraid of some of those animals, even though not at the clinical level. I am extremely afraid of uh, cockroaches, for instance, but but not not that I'll feign. I just how just uh, get really uncomfortable, and and so we're mostly focusing on everyday uh, uh, fear of that sort. But now that we have a study funded by the NIMH, we are actually going for um, um, we're testing actual patients, and we're basically using the same logic. We are decoding uh, those uh, representations from the uh, visual areas, and then uh, the idea is that even though we are not yet uh, changing the subjective ratings of fear, um, there's a hope that if we increase the dosage, it might. And, and even if it doesn't, uh, I think just getting rid of the physiological excessive arousal would be good anyway, because it can then, we can then, if we get rid of the physiological arousal, we can then go put these people back through the uh, normal exposure therapy, then maybe they would uh, show a, a, a reduced rate of attrition. That is, they may not drop out from the study so easily because physiologically is not so unpleasant for them. Another reason I think is interesting is usually in exposure therapy, uh, relapse is a problem. So the idea is that once they, uh, the patient learned that in this context with this therapist, I may, um, I may not be afraid of spider but I may not need to be afraid of spider, but once they go back hiking in, in the countryside, then, then the different contacts brought out the, the old memory again. And that is supported by the um, you know, decades of animal research showing that there's really no overwriting of old memory. You just, you just learn new memories uh, for different contexts, but the old memory never get erased. So, so that might be a reason why relapse happens, uh, but, the good thing about our procedure is we are directly targeting the, the, the brain voxels. So this is in a sense context free. We're directly manipulating the, the, the visual patterns of activity in, in your brain. And, and you only have one, one set of neurons for, for that. So if we actually manage to counter condition our fear for spider in the brain, that should basically apply to all contexts. So it might, might help with that kind of generalization. And finally, I think it's interesting in the sense that um, I might be I might be wrong. I'm, I, I'm aware I'm in a, in a psychiatry department, and and I think psychiatry is different from clinical psychology in a number of ways. But one one of which is that most of the treatments that are given by your colleagues are are, are double blinded, right? So they're they're double blinded, randomized controlled trial tested. So when you give drugs to people, you know that they are they are the drugs works better than placebo because the, the clinical trials have been run that way. Whereas in, uh, in, in the department that I used to be in, I used to be in a psychology department where my colleague Michelle Krask was, uh, she, she is still there, uh, where she is. Um, then most of the treatments that we, we train our clinical psychologists to do 
are by definition not double blind tested. Uh, it might sound a little bit extreme to say, but but I was I venture to say maybe all of clinical psychology isn't double blind tested. It's not because we don't know that it's good to control for placebo effects, but it's just very hard, right? I mean, how do you train a therapist when we're doing talking about talk therapy? How do we train a, a therapist to give a placebo sham uh, treatment? It's it's not it's not trivial. And even if you do, then I suppose the good therapists would understand that they're they are giving a sham treatment. So they would they would not be double blinded. Even the best you can do would maybe single blind randomized controlled. But here, because it's all computerized, we're taking not a not a drug, we're taking a, a, a completely clinical psychology uh, treatment uh, based on based on the rationale of exposure therapy or counter conditioning. But we are double blinding it because it's computerized. So I think even if we, the clinical trial doesn't work, I think that might be interesting from just a just an experimental hygiene kind of kind of point of view. Um, so we don't know the answer yet because I was supposed to know the answer, but the the pandemic really put a dent on our progress in this clinical trial. We are still like halfway through. So um, just talking about the future, uh, we are also uh, get going beyond these like uh, images of uh, uh, spiders and snakes and going to more realistic uh, animations like uh, car crashes. Uh, I, I, I st I'm still in America. In America, a quite a common, really life-threatening and fearful situation is, is just encountering the police. Uh, so we're also doing that um, and another kind of like socially awkward situation. We're trying to use uh, virtu uh, VR technology virtual reality to try to basically decode these more com more complex uh, visual engagements. And another area that we're also doing is pain. Uh, you can think about it the same way that pain is also easy to decode. Uh, so if you just compare pain versus no pain, a lot of different brain area uh, will show up. And the idea here is uh, not only we can do this study um, and, and do the same counter conditioning, but what we're doing is we are trying to pair the uh, the no pain or the, the reverse of the pain pattern with a kind of weird abstract pattern like this. So we can call it the talisman. So with this talisman um, uh, uh, image, once we associated this image with this pattern, then perhaps what we can do is then the patient can learn to imagine or hold a postcard of this image. Then every time they're in pain, they can just look at this image, which will then bring out this pattern that is the reverse of pain, then hopefully that can reduce their the, the, the pain condition. So we are also experimenting with something like that using the kind of similar logic. And hopefully uh, with pain patterns being so distributed, maybe we can do it with EEG too, uh, which will be a lot cheaper. So if you think about what we can decode in the brain, I mean, the analysis, uh, the, uh, the, the possibilities are quite endless. And this is a study from uh, Jack Alan's group and they basically just read stories to people uh, in, in the scanner and they find out that many semantic concepts can be decoded. So concepts like um, you know, motherhood, love, jealousy, power, money, and all, all this stuff can actually be decoded in the brain. And, and thinking about this and how you can use the same, the same logic and try to associate some of these concepts with reward and, and try to basically associate them in different ways. And that, that to me is potentially quite exciting. So uh, let me end with this quote. Uh, this is actually from uh, B.F. Skinner, which is one of a uh, psychologist's uh, um, um, uncle that we don't like to mention because behaviorism didn't turn out so well. But I think this is earlier on in his career, I think when it caught him in a moment that I think is, is, is an interesting um, uh, defense of behaviorism. So he was defending it. Uh, he was defending behaviorism against a challenge that uh, behaviorism ignores consciousness. And he would say, well, well, no, um, basically no major behaviorist has ever argued that science must limit itself to public events. So the fact that uh, consciousness is not public is not, is not a problem. I mean, we can still study it. The problem is that as a behaviorist, however, he questions the nature of these private events uh, and the role in the prediction and control of behavior. So essentially he was saying, well, you can study consciousness. It's not because they are private and therefore we don't study them. The problem is, you know, with these consciousness, all these like pretty vague notions, how can you actually uh, uh, create a science that would allow you to really predict and control behavior? And on the other hand, with, in Pavlov, we, we have this beautiful 
you know, setup of these associative learning, uh, uh, like Pavlovian and other kind of conditioning studies. And those are so powerful that we can actually generate useful um, uh, clinical applications out of them. You can use them to control and predict behavior. So that's why we, we ignore consciousness. That, that was his defense. And I hope that today maybe I've convinced you that maybe we can have to kick and eat it too. So by doing the same Pavlovian type of conditioning studies, we have a science that can allow us to predict and control behavior. But meanwhile, if we also mix in our ideas about what distinguish conscious and non-conscious brain representations, we can have an even better science than that. So we, we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. All right, so thank you. I, I should end here. And these are my collaborators, my lab members, my funding sources, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.